Joining me now is the retired United States Army Lieutenant Colonel and former Director of Uni European Affairs at the National Security Council, Alexander Vindman. Also with us tonight, Ben Rhodes, former Deputy National Security Advisor under President Obama and the co-host of Pod Save the World. Gentlemen, thank you. The world is just fundamentally a more dangerous place than it was four years ago. And what happens or what we do not just what happens in Ukraine, what America does, how America leads in Ukraine is something that not just our allies are worrying about and paying attention to, but more importantly, perhaps our adversaries. Yeah, I think that, look, we're living through a phase of an authoritarian renaissance of sorts of the ethno-nationalist variety alley, and it's been going on for several years. And one thing Americans have to understand is it's not just a foreign policy issue. It's the fact that this trend is interconnected. You don't get this many nationalist authoritarian leaders in this many different places, absent there being some interconnectivity. You've got Vladimir Putin in Russia. You've got Xi Jinping in China. You've got Narendra Modi in India. You've got Bibi Netanyahu in Israel. You've had Bolsonaro in Brazil. You've had Duterte in the Philippines. These are very different places, and I could unfortunately list five or 10 more countries at least, the reality is that there is a pushback against democracy. And Ukraine is the most acute manifestation of that, where you have the leader, the kind of vanguard of this autocratic trend in Vladimir Putin, literally trying to extinguish a sovereign democracy that is a part of Europe. Uh, that is both about the expansionist agenda of Russia that could lead to threaten other countries, including NATO countries in Eastern Europe, but it's also about Putin wanting to send a message about which way the world is going. Is the world going in the direction of people like Vladimir Putin, a world without law, a world without rules, a world in which might makes right alone? Or is the world going to stand up for some principle other than might makes right? That's what Ukraine is really about. And this is about our domestic politics as much as anything else, because if we are one of the dominoes that falls and Donald Trump returns to power, not only is Ukraine finished, essentially, they're going to be cut off of any U.S. assistance. Not only is Eastern Europe going to be potentially threatened by Russia and expansionism, but there are plenty of nationalists waiting in the wings in other democracies mm -hmm. in parts of Europe who might be poised to seize that momentum, get elected themselves. And we could be looking at a very different and more dangerous world even than today in a few years. Colonel Vindman, I, I remember in the early days of the war, there, were spec, there was speculation by a lot of intelligence agencies around the world, including our own, that Russia could take uh, Ukraine very quickly. They offered uh, Vindman the ability to leave the country. He declined. They offered, uh, I'm sorry, Vindman, I'm talking about uh, uh, Vladimir, uh, Vladimir Zelensky. You're a pretty brave guy, too, though. Um, they, they offered him the uh, ability to go to uh, the western part of Ukraine. He declined. He stayed in Kiev. He put, posted videos every night. He, he gives a message every night. He, 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 he motivates his people and tells them that they can win the war. And yet, around the world, and the Ukrainian people see this, He's got his officials, he's got himself going to America, begging, saying, we could lose this war if you don't continue to fund, fund us. How dangerous is this? How, could Ukraine lose this war? It's unlikely that Ukraine could lose in the next year or two. I think absent this funding, uh, the supplemental funding for Ukraine, things get con considerably more complex. There are still options on the table. The U.S. can uh, um, move in the direction of uh, for uh, asset forfeiture and transfer of, of these $300 billion in Russian central bank assets. That's one of the solutions. But it really does get complex because it looks like we're just not so serious. We're not serious about our security. We're not sec serious about our allies. And the fact is that invites attacks. That invites uh, Russia to uh, conduct th this war in the first place, I think, uh, on the heels of a January 6th insurrection, on the, uh, the heels of hyper-partisanship driven by MAGA. It invites the uh, Iranians to uh, advance their interests in the Middle East, including propelling their uh, proxy networks to attack U.S. and um, world interests. And, you know, we're talking about world commerce. It propels the Chinese to recalculate the cost-benefit analysis on conducting a war to seize Taiwan and bring it back into the fold. Uh, there are the Venezuelans in Latin America with their aspirations to seize Guyanan oil, um, DPRK, and its agenda uh, to extort resources and, and maintain power. These are all opportunists. These are opportunities that smell blood in the water and see an opportunity to uh, really go after democracies that are uh, waffling and seem disinterested in investing in their security. 
And this is the one area that, you know, I, it really does concern me. I think we may possibly have turned the corner. At least there are some indications that the population in the U.S. is voting on democracy. It is mm -hmm. not a pattern, but we are not serious about our security. There are fundamental uh, decisions that need to be made about Ukraine supplemental aid. And the administration could take uh, steps on its own right to really significantly improve the support to Ukraine. That's intelligence sharing. That's logistical support. It is. These are not expensive, uh, big ticket items. These are small policy changes that the administration could take on its own and just has refused to do that. And I really urge the administration to, to see the dangers of Ukraine um, maybe flagging, uh, losing territory and inspiring other authoritarian regimes to advance. This this articulation that, that uh, Colonel Vindman had, Ben, about it, it just looks like we're not serious. This is obviously, when you were at the National Security Council, this is a very, very important issue, right? The idea is when, when Donald Trump weakened NATO, it's not that he actually did anything. He sort of said... We're not that serious about this. You guys need to do this. We may not be around. It, it's these implications that we're not going to be solid partners to you. You and I have talked to, to world leaders who are very, very concerned about this. They do think that if they have to make a determination that the United States is not serious, they start strategizing about their, their worldview differently. Yeah, that's right. And, and let me try to be very specific about this, Ali, because this began uh, to get worse in the Obama years, where it used to be that there were some baseline issues of national security, where bitter political opponents, you know, like John McCain and Barack Obama, um, who might even have disagreements about foreign policy, they would agree on the building blocks of what American national security was. You know, NATO, Article 5 commitments, the collective defense of NATO, the, the need to stand up for certain values around the world. Um, and that was a continuum since World War II and through the Cold War. You started to see in a trend where Republicans would politicize every aspect of national security. If Barack Obama was for one thing one day, they'd be for against it. If he switched his position somehow, then they'd switch their position. And that's obviously gotten worse ever since then. And Donald Trump's election, when he came in and he tore up a whole bunch of agreements that Obama had reached, and he basically upended uh, American policy when it came to even at first hesitating to articulate the common defense of NATO. The message that sent was America is not reliable. The dysfunction and toxicity in its democracy has rendered it an unreliable superpower and ally. And the the thing that Joe Biden can't fix himself mm -hmm. is that continues to this day. Even allies who welcome Joe Biden, welcome the leadership of the United States uh, and rallying NATO around Ukraine, they're sitting back and wondering, well, is Donald Trump going to come back? Mm. Vladimir Putin is sitting there thinking, I just have to wait this guy out. Maybe I have to interfere in the 2024 election to try to get Donald Trump elected. My strategy is a waiting game. I, as a dictator, have more staying power than American democracy because they're swinging back and forth like a crazy pendulum and they're not reliable. And that's what this is really about. If we cannot sustain a policy, if we cannot sustain something like the basic support for Ukraine, a democratic country that is under assault, if we can't sustain that for more than a couple of years because Congress can't get its act together, how is any nation in the world going to trust our word? How are allies going to trust our collective defense agreements? If they cannot do that, they are going to start to hedge. They are going to start to bend to the pressure from a China or Russia because the United States can no longer be relied on as the cornerstone of their security. We are already dealing with that just because of Donald Trump's previous administration. If he gets back into the White House, that's gone for a generation at least if it's something we can ever get back. That is how high the stakes are in this election. It's important that we realize that as we are struggling for democracy in our own country, that we have a massive role to play in the uh, in the rest of the world. Guys, thanks very much. We